I have a question about the uh, grade for the most recent project. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, is our grade uh, entirely just what the auto grader returns or it, uh, do you uh, look at the code itself to see if it's uh, neat and properly notated as well? Uh, I'm gonna just go, so the question was, is the grade from the auto grader your grade on the project? The answer is yes, plus whatever corrections for the RAN thing. Um, that's too much work to actually read everybody's code. Oh, thank heavens. Okay. I think you guys can see that, right? Yes, we can. Okay. That took long enough. Okay. Um, let me make sure there's nothing that I wanted to say at the beginning of class. Oh, I guess. Well, oh well. I guess you. I, I should have told you to to do the the mid class mid course survey while I was getting everything ready. Oh well. Um, I'll probably give you. I'll, I'll give you a couple minutes at the end. Um, so this is going to be kind of a shorter class. Um, and then. There's. The next thing that, that'll be due is, is homework two, which is due on the fifth. So that's a week and two days from now. So just be aware of that. All right. Well, that took long enough. Um, and we'll, we'll see how this goes. So so last time we, we finished up talking about this this problem with virtual caches. So, so the first problem that we saw was just the context switch problem where two programs could be trying to access the same virtual address, even though it's a different physical address. And so um, in this situation, the mitigation would be to just flush the cache uh, when you context switch. But that's kind of annoying because flushing the cache, obviously, we have to invalidate everything. We, we lose any advantages that we have from the cache. Then we looked at aliasing. And uh, as, a, as a recap of what this is, the idea is that we have two virtual addresses mapped to the same physical address. Here in our page table, we have, for example, OX1000 and OX2000, both pointing to the same physical memory address. Now, if we have a virtual cache and we pull both of these values in, we're gonna end up with the data in two different places in our cache. So we have a copy of it in, in both the OX1000 and OX2000 um, slots in our cache. The issue is when we store a new value, for example, we store B into OX1000, it, it should update both of them because they're pointed to the same memory address, physical memory address, but it won't because uh, it's a virtual cache. We're dealing with these virtual uh, uh, addresses rather than the physical addresses. And so if we then load from OX2000, then it's gonna give us the wrong value. It's gonna give us A, which is the previous value of this thing. Let's see. I'm going to get this computer up and running so that I can switch to it in a few minutes. 
Oh dear. Okay, so um, why might this happen? We looked at this case, this copy on write case. This is the most likely reason for aliasing to occur, or at least one of the more common, common reasons. And the idea is that we have uh, a copy of a large amount of data, and we want to just, instead of actually performing the copy, what we'll do is we'll just redirect the pointers to do the same thing as a copy, but uh, what we'll do then is if we ever have to write to that uh, that um, copy, we you know we'll, we'll have to actually perform the the real copy, not just the, this fake copy where we um, redirect the pointer. Uh, and in this example, we're copying from A to B, and we're copying a whole lot of memory. And instead of doing, you know, moving it in the physical address space uh, or copying it in the physical address space, all we're doing is redirecting the pointer. So yeah, two virtual addresses, both pointing to the same physical address. Um, copy and write, by the way, just as a kind of side note, is, is pretty common um, both in, in memory, but especially on, on like uh, file systems because file systems are even slower and um, there's plenty of copy and write file systems out there. Um, they're especially like, you know, like ZFS or whatever, which is used. Uh, I think it's, I think they're, that or ButterFS is used at Facebook. You know, it's, it's very, uh, very big companies using this sort of technology because I mean, it's just good. Um, And VMs as well, uh, virtual machine disks often use copy and write um, because you want to preserve, you know, the, the 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 file space for that as well. And in general, um, you know, this mem copy might be happening, and we then discard A, right? So it's kind of pointless. If we do the mem copy and then discard A to have like copied all the data, it, it makes more sense to just redirect the pointer. And this allows us to, to do it without the programmer uh, intervening and actually doing that manually. So what uh, the question is, what is aliasing in this context? So basically, um, aliasing is, is when we have two virtual addresses pointed to the same thing. And here uh, in our virtual address space, char A, star, char star A, and char star B are two different um, virtual addresses, but they're both pointing to the same uh, physical address. Um, so what are some advantages of, of this? Um, we've kind of talked a little bit about, about some of them, but Adjusting the page table is just going to be much faster for large copies. So if we're just doing this this copy, all we have to do is go and update the page table rather than, um, uh, um, you know, actually doing the update so that it's pointed over over here. And most likely, or potentially, these aren't continuous in memory anyway. So we that would be really annoying. Um, to have to do that. And then um, the way it works is that the initial copy is free, zero or pretty close to zero latency. Um, and then subsequent writes. So if we actually need to write into B, then we would perform the copy. Um, and there are syscalls that let you do this arbitrarily. Um, Let's see if this works. Okay, any questions? Did I answer your question, Wyatt? Okay, excellent. Um,
I don't know what's going on with with this. Oh, I need to run with upgrade maybe. Oh well. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions on this, we'll hop into the next topic. Which is pipelining. So um, if, you, if you notice, uh, it's the wrong lecture number. Sorry, I just copied. I'm using Dr. Wu's slide because there's a lot of diagrams and I didn't want to like transcribe any of them and it wasn't actually that useful. Um, and our slide numbers are offset by one because I split lecture three into th lecture three and four. So sorry about the, the lecture number being a little bit weird. Okay, so let's review what is what is pipelining, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about pipelining hazards, which are kind of the, the pitfalls that we might run into uh, with a pipeline context. Okay, so. Let's pretend it's laundry day and we want to do our laundry. Um, there's kind of four steps. Um, we put the dirty stuff into the washer. When the washer is done, we put it into the dryer. It dries it and we take it out and we, we fold them. So this is the third step. And the fourth step um, is we have to put the clothes away. And just to make it kind of a little bit more conducive to pipelining, let's just say that we don't have to do both of these. You know, we don't have to be the one putting it away. We'll get our roommate uh, to help us out because um, we have a, a very, very nice roommate. Okay, so that's that's all well and good. Um, if we do it naively, and nobody does this, right? Like you would just, you know, put in one load into the washer, then do the dryer, then fold it and put it away, and then go start another load. Actually, this does kind of look like what I do sometimes. It's kind of dumb. Bribe them with food. Yeah, great idea. That's a, that's a wonderful idea. Um, and you'll have time to make the food because you'll be pipelined like, uh, like, like this. Um, so obviously, once the washer is available, we can just put in the next load, right? Um, so we, we don't have to wait for the entire process to go through. We can, uh, we can start immediately uh, on this, on the washer. And the same goes for the dryer and folding and putting stuff away. Right? Assuming that we have our, our roommate helping us. Now, um, this allows us to basically do four loads at a time, right? So once we've once we've gotten started, let's say that we have like infinite loads of laundry or pretty close to infinite loads of laundry, we can have four of them going at once. One of them's in the washing stage. One of them is in the drying stage. One of them is in the folding stage. One of them is in the putting away a stage. Um, and there's no additional resources necessary, right? We still have the same exact washer, same exact dryer, same exact roommate, but we, we quadrupled our, our throughput. What we did not do is reduce the latency per load, right? It's still gonna take, what is this, two hours to do a load, but we can do, four times as many loads in, in a given amount of time as we could before. Now, um, let's just say we have a, a four stage pipeline. So basically the exact picture that I was showing you. Uh, and every stage takes an hour. How long is it gonna take to do 100 loads? That's not on the worksheet. This is kind of just addition. Anybody? Like 104 
104. Yeah, we do need to offset, but by how much? 103? Yeah, so it's going to be 103 because um, basically the way, way to, to think about this is uh, we need to fill it up entirely. We need to fill up our pipeline entirely, and that takes four cycles. But on the fourth, cy fourth cycle, we get something done. So every, so like turn these into hours instead of half hours. And then every hour after this, we're going to have one of our loads finished. But for the first three hours, we didn't. For the first three hours, there was, was, uh, wasn't anything finishing. Um, so it's going to take 103 hours, which sounds pretty terrible to do laundry. Thank goodness. I just toss all of them in pretty much at the same time. That's the advantage of always wearing, you know, jeans and a dark t-shirt. Throw everything in at once. Okay, so then um, if we have a four-stage pipeline, every stage takes an hour, how long does it take to finish end loads? N plus three. And in general, if you have a, let's just say K stage pipeline, it'd be N plus K minus one. Now, it's maybe not, not that useful to actually say, oh, well, these extra, you know, three cycles at the beginning, that's really gonna matter. 103 versus 100 hours isn't, isn't like that consequential. Um, and especially not like 10,000 versus 10,003. Um, there's not, it's, it's not very useful to, to include that. So a lot of times we'll just say, on average, we'll be able to complete N. Assuming that our pipeline is perfect and doesn't ever have any issues where, you know, we're running into each other or the roommate has to go and, you know, sleep or something. Now, the reality though, is that this is not how, how it, it works. Hopefully, you know, the folding and putting away probably are gonna take less time than, than the washing and, and drying, uh, unless you're really, really like OCD about it. Um, and maybe let's just say that the drying stage takes the longest, right? So this is, it takes an hour rather than half an hour. And the, the issue is that then that defines the throughput. Um, it, it's, it's going to cause us to basically have to wait half an hour before we can start the next load because if we do it too soon, we're gonna be just, it'll be just there in the washer and, and uh, we can't put it in the dryer yet because the dryer's not finished with the last load. Okay, so this is kind of the, the reality. And um, in computer architecture, most of the time, the, the, the big stage is, is memory, um, which is kind of uh, gonna, be, gonna be a theme um, throughout this, this class. Hopefully you've already caught on. Pipelining is pretty much everywhere too. So, Obviously, we saw laundry. You probably can't really take too much advantage of it because you maybe have like what four loads at most. But if you're trying to make a car, um, where you gotta you know build the frame, install the, all the parts, paint it, then you know there's tons of other stuff. These are this is just being very simplistic here. Um, you know this clearly is a pipeline as well. And this was the novel idea of an assembly line. We're able to do multiple things at once. And um, now, you know, all this stuff is done by robots. So they don't even have to go to sleep. And it's great. Except for the people who used to work at the factory. Um, so let's talk about what an ideal pipeline is. So. Ideally, everything goes through the same stages. Um, so let, let's just go back to our uh, 
kind of laundry analogy and, and think of something, a case where that wouldn't be the case. Maybe we are, are washing um, kind of a nice shirt or something and we don't want to put it in the dryer. So we like, it has to go off and do something else like get ironed or something. Um, and that's, uh, that's annoying. We, that's not ideal. Um, also, we don't want any sharing of resources between the stages. So like the washer, washing example is really nice because we don't have to share anything, assuming we have a roommate. But if we do have a roommate, then we are sharing resources between the folding and putting away stage because you have to do both. Additionally, the propagation delay um, through all pipeline stages is equal in an ideal case. And this basically means the time it takes for each stage is the same. Like we don't want to be in the situation where we're waiting for the for the dryer to finish, for example, while we're we're totally done folding up all the laundry. Additionally, well, we don't ideally we don't want the scheduling of anything, uh, any of a transaction entering the pipeline to be affected by the transactions in other stages. So ideally, you know, um, we all we don't have to think about whether or not we should put something into the pipeline or not. And obviously this is kind of, you know, this is the case with laundry because it's just laundry. But if you had something crazy where like, I don't know, uh, if during the folding stage, like you had to do some calculation of which clothes to put that back into the, to the washing machine, which sounds crazy, but like, just bear with me, um, then, then that would be an issue. Um, you wouldn't know, you'd have to go all the way to the folding stage and then you'd know which clothes to put in next. Did I answer your question about propagation delay, Wyatt? Okay, so this is what computers do. It's very, uh, or well, this is a fairly simple execution cycle, but it's the one we'll, we will work with. There's, there's five main steps that we have to do. And we'll, we'll see in a, in a couple of sec minutes here that this can be pipelined. So the first step is instruction fetch. We need to find out what operation we need to actually perform. And to do that, we have to go into memory and, and find uh, the instruction and pull it in. The next thing we have to do is we have to uh, decode the instruction. So we have the instruction in you know, some buffer. Now we have to actually read it out and get the values from it. Um, and we also have to grab any of the, the operands from the registers. Uh, so if we have an add, add R1 plus R2, we would have to go fetch R1 and R2 so that we can put them in to our addition logic later on, which is step three. So this is the execute step where we actually execute the addition or calculate the memory address. Um, if we have the memory offset or something like that. So that's step three. Then we have to actually go out and get the data from memory. If, if we have to, maybe we don't have to, maybe it's just an add and you know, all the data is in registers already and we don't have to do anything on this step. And that's always really nice. And then the last thing is we have to store or write back any result to, to the register. Um, so if it's a memory operation, we would have to get the memory, uh, uh, um, the value from the memory address and, and put it back into the, into the register. Or we might have to, if it's an add, for example, we would have to take the calculation and store it back into, into the appropriate register.
So let's talk about mints, which we talked to, which we uh, we had an overview of a couple of weeks ago now. Um, it goes through these exact exact same steps, and we'll we'll kind of dis dissect uh, this diagram, uh, which which um, kind of shows an, a simplified, unpipelined data path for MIPS. And let's just look at a high level. Um, we'll ignore all the lines for, for a moment. But uh, what we see here is instruction memory. So this is where we're getting the actual instructions we want to execute. That's this first, this first step. We're, we're fetching stuff out of this instruction memory and then putting it through all these you know, circuits and everything. Um, in here, kind of in between this, this muxer here and, and this uh, um, uh, uh, register file, we are grabbing the values that we need for the operand. And then down here, Oh, and that's that's this step here, step two. Then our third step is over here, where we actually do the addition um, or multiplication or whatever operation in the um, ALU. And that was this step here, step three. And then we use that. If we need to do any memory operations and uh, write or or read, and that happens in the state of memory part of the pipeline, and then we finally um, have to store and write back the results. So you see this line; it kind of goes all the way back over here. Okay, so that's um, that's the high level uh, overview. What we'll, what we'll do is we'll um, We'll talk about all these later, but I think for now, um, let's just look at a simplified view, um, simplified unified, uh, unpipeline, sorry, data path. So we'll get rid of a lot of those lines because, I mean, they matter, but not, a, not the end of the world if we don't look at them yet. All right, so what's happening here? Uh, first of all, how do we know which address to go look at in the instruction memory? Well, we have this program counter, which just keeps track of where we are in our program. And uh, what you'll see is that there's this loop here, which just adds four to the instruction, uh, to the program counter every single time. And this is allowing us to go to the next instruction. Obviously, up in the, up here, there's a lot more complicated stuff. There's a lot more lines that could potentially go back to program counter because of branches and such, but let's ignore branches because they're annoying. So we grab the data from instruction memory and then um, either there's an immediate, so this is like the I instruction, or we have to pull out stuff from registers. And that's, uh, that's these guys here and or we have to like write to a register as well so this is this is kind of the um if we're if we're getting the data back from a alu operation or something like that we would have to write it back to a register that's what this is showing and potentially we get mm, some different values out of our our uh, registers this could be just values that we need to do addition on or memory addresses, whatever. And we figure out, uh, we, we pass those into the ALU. Now, uh, this, this guy here is a, is a multiplexer, meaning that it could come either from a register or from an immediate. So this is allowing us to have both, both cases where we pull our, our data from a register or if you remember back to the MIPS overview, we just pull it from one of those I values that is in the instruction. Um, so 
So then we go out to memory with the address um, that we got from the calculation in the ALU. Um, and we will read that, or we will write the data from some register to memory. So these are the two options for, for what we could do here. And then lastly, if there's anything to write back, we'll, we'll go back around and, and put it in the register. Oh, and, and also, if we don't have to do any memory, we'll just bypass it down here. Again, another multiplexer so that we can figure out which thing to write back. All right, any questions on this? Can you repeat the last thing you said about the multiplexer? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this last multiplexer here? Yeah, just like okay. repeat the last sentence, sorry. Sure, sure, no worries. Uh, so basically, um, this multiplexer is selecting what we want to write back to our register file. Um, so this the output is is this arrow which goes all the way back and writes a value to a register. And the two things that we can select are either the output of the ALU operation. So this is like if we do an add and that's all we need to do, then we would just loop it down and around over here. Um, and we would select that. We wouldn't worry about anything from memory. However, if it is a memory op um, that is a read, we would we would pull in the read address um, or read data, the data from memory, and then that's what we would write back to uh, the register. Did that help? Yes, a bunch. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So whenever whenever you see these little symbols here, just know we're selecting one of these things to be the one that actually goes through. Um, Like, so for example, this one here, uh, we're selecting either that, um, depending on the instruction type, we're gonna, the, the, the place where we have to write the data back is different. Um, and the, it's either, you know, the one of uh, the second or third field or whatever um, in your instruction is either another register for where to write to, or it's a one from where to, one defining where you should read from. So that's just kind of how that's how that's working. Okay. Um, so let's pipeline this. Let's use the steps that we defined over here and just add some pipelines um, so that uh, we can have thing, uh, multiple instructions going at the same time. We kind of on the last slide already looked at kind of the high level idea, but now we'll not only just look at it, we'll actually use that high level idea, high level concept to split up our execution into uh, five different stages. Okay, so we have our fetch phase. Again, this is where we go fetch the data from the instruction memory. We have our decode. So this is like this part here. And then register fetch, which is, you know, grabbing stuff from the register. And then we have an execution phase, phase, which is our ALU operation. And then we do our memory phase, which goes and uh, grabs stuff from memory. And then our last phase is the write back phase, where we loop back any data over to our register. Now, if you notice between these two slides, in addition to some gray lines and some extra text, there's also these blue things here. So for example, this one here, oh dear, these ones here. And these are basically just buffers to hold the data before the next page starts. Because it would be really bad, for example, if like, let's just say, the decode and register fetch phase was really fast. And then it just started shoving data into the ALU before it was done. That, that wouldn't be ideal. So we, we have to buffer um, between the, the phases.
And um, the nice, so let's just say that each one of these stages takes five seconds, right? Or one second each. So, so the entire thing takes five seconds. Well, if we had, um, if we weren't pipelines, if we were in this situation, we would have to have a one cycle every five seconds. Whereas with the pipeline, we speed up our clock cycle. Um, so now we have one cycle per second. And, and uh, so our, our clock cycle has increased or our, uh, our cycle time has decreased, but our, our throughput is still the same. But uh, as we mentioned before, most likely these are not equivalently uh, sized as far as latency goes. So um, our actual clock time is going to be whatever the max of all these things are. And it's, it's most likely your memory phase. All right. Any questions? Okay, so for all this to happen, we're gonna to have to have a, a controller that's controlling what each stage is doing. Um, so this, this controller is gonna depend on, on the various instructions uh, as well. And it'll tell the, multi, the various multiplexers which ones to select from. It'll tell the ALU what to do. It'll tell the memory controller whether or not this is a read or a write um and then you know tell this multiplexer over here so we'll we'll look at this though because this is this is this is kind of the the crux of it here we have on this axis we have time so each one of these uh, as as amelia mentioned is a tick of the clock this is a clock cycle and in clock cycle zero or time zero we can run the first part of our first instruction and that's our instruction fetch so this is the nomenclature we're going to use if is the instruction fetch phase id is instruction to code ex execute ma is a memory and then write back so time zero we can run instruction fetch for the first instruction. Then we move on to the next cycle. That data has now gone into the, the code and register fetch phase. So it's in the ID phase on, on T, T2 or T1. Um, and then we can, the, the fetching logic is available. We can just go ahead and fetch, um, fetch instruction two. And once we've done that, the next cycle, now instruction one is over in this phase, instruction two is over here, instruction three can be, be fetched, and so on and so forth. And eventually we'll have after four cycles, on the fifth cycle here, we will actually have our, um, uh, pipeline full. So every bit of our pipeline is being utilized by some instruction, um, the fifth one is being fetched while the fourth one is being decoded while the third one is being executed and the second one is doing its memory stuff and the first one is writing back. Okay, so this is this is the idea and this is the ideal case. Unfortunately, the ideal is well there, there's problems with it and we'll talk about them. Um so oh there the other, the other way of, of, of uh, kind of, so th there's, there's two different ways of writing these sort of pipeline tables. One is where you have, oh dear, uh, time on the, on the x-axis. This is the one that I think is most useful to look at personally, but you might like this one better where, um, or sorry, so time is on this axis, instructions are on this axis. Um, 
that you can also have time on on this axis and then have the different resources so your different uh stages of your pipeline on this axis the y-axis um and it's kind of the same thing you're seeing that oh on time zero instruction one is being uh fetched instruction two is being fetched at time one etc and it's just kind of like diagonal instruction one kind of goes through the pipeline like this instruction two goes diagonally like that so on and so forth um it results in the same thing right you you're full at time four and you can kind of see what's being executed i just think personally this is what makes more sense to me but totally fine if there's something else that makes sense to you or this one makes sense to you all right so there's some problems unfortunately computers are not doing laundry um well actually i guess they kind of are with robots but not this low level um we have a bunch of problems with our pipeline because instructions are going to interact with each other um, and there's there's three main hazards is what we're going to what we call them uh, that can cause our pipeline to have issues okay so our first hazard is a structural hazard um, so this happens when we have an instruction um, that is needing a resource that is used by another instruction that's also in a pipeline okay so kind of think of it like um, if you needed to wash your clothes twice and are like in two different parts of, of your washing clothes and putting them away pipeline if you had to wash them twice in different places i don't know maybe it's like really dirty or something that would be a structural hazard because you need it at two different times that's also a really dumb example but let's just go with it anyway that's our first hazard the second hazard is a data hazard um, this is when one instruction depends on data from another instruction so um, a good example of this is let's just say we have an addition instruction followed by a, a, and we put it in the result into r3 and then the next instruction needs r3 for you know i don't know doing another addition or a multiplication or something that would be a data hazard the last hazard is a control hazard and this is um, when the the instruction that should be executed um, depends on a previous instruction so if the previous instruction is a branch and it's like branch if this register is equal or not equal to zero well we need to know we, uh, we we need to know which instruction to fetch and that's pretty hard if we don't know the results of the branch yet um, so this is a control hazard and those are the three hazards that we're going to have to deal with and we'll we'll talk about each one in turn any questions so far i have a question why can you not load the shared library whatever um my computer is having a having a bad day i'll need to look at that okay so let's talk about structural hazards our first structural hazard that we want to look at is the fact that we have unified memory so if you notice there's memory here and there's memory here and there's nothing against self-modifying code for example that's going in and adjusting the memory that we're actually using over here in the instruction memory uh, there's nothing against that in in mips so that's totally possible um, and and really you know this looks all all nice and pristine but really it's, it's more like this um, where we have a a unified memory which 
is is dealing with both instruction and data memory. Um, and this is a problem. There's contention on our memory model module here. So let's fix that. And we'll make it instead of one cycle memory, let's make it two cycles. Oh dear. And on this first cycle, we'll do, a re do the write. And then on the second cycle, we'll do the read. Um, so now um, we, we don't have any, any contention anymore. Um, it's all happening at, we, we kind of have two different stages and we can do uh, the, uh, like re we can do concurrent reads because that's totally fine. The issue is if like, you know, this write is coming in and we're reading from the same thing here. Well, now we just have done the write and then we, in the second part, we do the read and we can do that uh, read concurrently after we've done the, the write um, in our memory uh, uh, pipeline or pipeline stage. So here's an example of the next, next hazard. So that's structural hazard. The next hazard is data hazard. So here's two instructions. We have uh, R0 plus R10, and we're putting it into register one. So add, add I, you know, R1, R0, and then 10. And then we're using register one in the next instruction. So we have this add immediate R4, R, R1, and then 17. Uh, obviously, this second instruction depends on the first instruction's result. Like it depends on R0 plus R10 to determine how, how much to add to 17. And this is a problem um, because I'm not sure what this, what I'm supposed to say about this diagram. But the problem is like, if, if you haven't computed this value yet, it's not gonna be ready. It's not gonna be in the register in time. Um, so you're gonna pull a, something stale most likely. Um, okay. Questions. Now, let's talk about different kinds of dependencies we might have. Okay. So the first dependency is the one that we just saw, where we do a read after a write. So we we write to some register and then we need to read out of it on the next instruction or some later instruction. This is a read after write dependence. The next one is an anti-dependence. So this is write after read. Um, so we, we read R1 off R2. So we do some, some operation involving R1 and then um, we put it into R3. And then we write to R1. So it's this write is after the read. Um, and it's really important, for example, when we talk about out of order execution that we don't just be like, ah, we can put this one above. We can do the write before the read. Um, that's going to uh, be, be kind of bad. because We'll get the wrong value for this one. So that's. Uh, another dep uh, dependence that we have. Um, and then the last one is an output dependence. This is a, a, a write after write is the other terminology for it. And it's literally what it sounds like. You, you do some write uh, to the same register after you've written to it before. And throughout all of this 
all of the stuff that we're going to talk about, we need to ensure that all of these constraints are still met. So whatever we do, if the assembly code had uh, the read after the write, well, first of all, it needs to happen after uh, after the write, and it also has to have the correct data from this previous write. If we have a write after read, we need to make sure that the read happens before the write. And if we have a write after write, we need to make sure that those writes are coming in in order. Okay. Um, and this is will be important as we're talking about pipelining. It'll also be important as we're talking about out of order execution. It's just pretty important to to not have ish, you know, <laughs> not have your dependencies get screwed up. Because we basically like the ideal here is that we we make it look like we just have a non pipeline thing. It looks like it's just executing one instruction, then it's executing another instruction, then it's executing another. But we're trying to make that faster, so we do this pipelining thing, and we still need to maintain that appearance that it's just doing one after another, even though it's doing multiple at the same time. So, um, one of the one way that we can get rid of these data hazards is we can stall, um, and that that basically is like. We need some data from a previous instruction. We will just wait. We'll just like stop executing this instruction. We'll we'll uh, um, um, wait until it's actually written back to our register. So in this case, oh dear, I keep I keep doing that. Um, uh, R zero plus ten, and then we're putting that into R one. Well, we'll wait until R one has been updated before we continue on with this instruction. Um, and we have to, we can go to the instruction to code phase on the second instruction. We can, we have to figure out if we need to stall or not. But after we have um, uh, determined if we need to, to stall, then we will, you know, have this stall condition, which will, which will tell the various uh, components, hey, stop, just like, don't, don't go on. So um, unfortunately, you know, most of the, you know, ads are, you know, that's okay. We can, we, we, we don't have to stall too much because we will get the data after the ALU stage. But what if we have some memory operation? Um, There we go. So let's just say we have some memory R1 plus, se uh, uh, plus seven, and we, we're putting R2 into here. And then we do a read from memory where we have R3 plus five, and then we're, we're putting that into R4. So the question is, can there be any data hazards with this instruction sequence? There's a hint up here. Is that going to be a data hazard if R1 plus 7 is equal to R3 plus 5? Yeah, uh, it's kind of unfortunate, right? So with memory, because of the fact that we're doing these different offsets, um, and R1 and R3 are, can be arbitrary, uh, these can totally be pointing to the same index in memory. And that's going to be really unfortunate. We're going to have to wait until We've actually done the right over here before we can we can know what data we need to have for R4. Uh, oh dear. So this is the same example as we saw in the previous slide.
and written out a little bit more verbosely. Again, because registers are arbitrary, we can be reading to and from the same address, even though it may not look like it. Um, if we can complete the memory in uh, one cycle, um, then we'll be okay. Because with our pipeline, if we can, you know, write to write uh, on the on the write instruction, and then it's just done as soon as the next instruction, the read instruction comes in, we're fine. Um, the data has been updated. Uh, we can just pull it out of the, the memory. The issue comes with the fact that this is an actually realistic, most likely um, any realistic memory system will, will require more careful handling uh, of these loads and stores because of the, of the latency involved. Uh, we've already seen like, you know, if this is just L1 cache, it's probably okay. But if it's an L2 or L3, we would need to have something more intelligent. So um, the biggest thing that we can do is we can add bypasses. And these basically allow us to forward data uh, backwards through our pipeline um, to the next instruction. So going back to our R1 um, is equal to R0 plus 10 example, once we've computed that, we can just forward it all the way back to uh, our uh, instruction to code stage so that when it comes in for the next instruction, we can just use this new value, even though it hasn't yet been, even though it hasn't yet hit a register, we can still have the correct value when we do the execute stage on instruction two. So a question, can the bypass help in these, in these two um, situations, specifically this bypass where we're bypassing from the a end of the ALU stage into the um, instruction to code stage. We've, we've seen that this one works, but to, would this one, uh, would this instruction sequence be helped by bypass? No. I have one vote for no. Any other votes? Okay, there's two more votes, a no and a yes. All right, great voter participation. Um, somebody who said no, why? Yes. The load from memory is a different part of the process. Exactly, yeah. So um, we don't know the value that we're gonna put into R1 until after this memory stage. So this forward isn't doing us any good. It's like, congratulations, we've calculated the memory address that we're gonna pull from in the next stage. So that's not, that's not so cool. Um, uh, th that, this particular bypass isn't gonna help us. Maybe we could add another bypass from the memory stage, but again, you know, we're, we're not talking about a bypass from the memory stage right now. Okay, what about um, this last instruction set? And then we'll, we'll call it, uh, I'll give you a, a few minutes to fill out the midterm um, uh, survey thing. I don't actually know where it is. Maybe I'll, I'll look that up too. Um, so we have a jump and link 500, and then um, the same instruction, R4 plus R31 plus, that should be a seven, it's got cut off. Um, for context, this jump and link instruction writes to R31. It writes the return address to that 
Um, so is this bypass going to help? Yeah, so it, it's, it's not really going to help because um, the value of, of this jump and link is, gonna, is probably going to be um, from uh, not going to be written until this right back stage. OK. Any questions? We'll do the worksheet next time. Okay, let me pull up the email from the, and see where you're supposed to go to get this. Okay, so it's on Canvas and you just go and you, uh, you log in and it prompts you. Okay, yeah, so go click on the course and fill out the survey. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we'll we'll call it there, and we'll we'll um, do the worksheet next next week. <sighs> All right. Thanks, guys. I will be at office hours.